All right, we're outside the video revival here. It is Horror Happens Radio, the Brooklyn Horror Film Festival. About to step in for another screening of a title that I can possibly uh, pronounce or hope to understand or anything like that. And uh, I'm just going to go simple. Brian, Jen, hey, how you two hi. doing tonight here? Excellent. Excellent? Yeah, awesome. Life is good. This is a big weekend. Big feature. Get my gun. It's th- this weekend. Uh, preview is, well, I should say the world premiere is tomorrow night here in Brooklyn. First to you, Brian, what made a second year festival like the Brooklyn Horror Film Festival the place the world premiere this film? We're local. <clears throat> We're from New York City, so it, it seemed like a, the perfect place to have our world premiere. This way, cast and crew would have a chance to enjoy it with a, a real audience for the first time. Jen, what about you? Uh, a lot of the locations were, actually several of the locations were filmed in Brooklyn uh, and several others were out in New York City, uh, Manhattan and the Bronx. And so it just seemed, again, it just seems supernatural that like not only are cast and crew from New York City, um, locations in New York City, and then when you look at the, the first wave of lineup from the festival as well, I mean, we're in super great company, you know, I couldn't, I mean, the films here that are playing are phenomenal and I, I just, I feel really good about our company, you know, with other filmmakers, and you know, it's a great festival. It's a great city, and so exploitation film. You know, <laughs> how can you know how could we do wrong, right? Exactly. Co-writing an exploitation film, especially in the modern day, you want to have an homage touch, as well as something that connects to a younger crowd, because you're going to have a wide variety yep. watching. From the writing side, what was the thinking going into this project to connect to the fans? Uh, so one of the th- one of the films that were you know super inspirational for us was uh, Miss Forty Five, and it's super Absolutely. interesting because a lot of people are, are calling it a rape revenge film and comparing it to uh, I Spit on Your Grave, which I didn't necessarily think of. Um, in the very beginning but what I do like is that you know a lot of people are also comparing it to Inside which was a huge we love that film yeah Yeah. so it's like this wild like combination of of, you know I take that as like what a great compliment you know a combination of if Miss 45 and Inside had a sick demon baby (laughs) and gave birth to it that's get my gun right and so yeah so I feel like it hits both sides, you know? It hits the, the crowd that likes the older, grimier grindhouse stuff. And then, but it also hits like, you know, like the newer crowd that's into like that, you know, the inside, the, the French new wave of uh, horror films at the same time. And so I think it, I think both folks, you know, both, both crowds will like it. Absolutely. Brian, same to you, looking at a project like this, you, Jen talked about the inside, also Miss 45. Exploitation can be really tricky to pull off. A lot of times you only see exploitation in the real, well underground style. Very rarely do you see it on more of a mainstream level. It, how do you connect to the audience out there and make it for the younger generation as well as the fans of the old? Well, one thing I didn't want to do, which I see a lot of fucking... When I see a lot of newer exploitation films are almost like a parody of exploitation. Right. Yeah. So they get a little hokey. They get a, it's, it goes a little too far because back then it just seems like like a dude was just trying to make a crazy movie and right. that's it. it they and they made a crazy to fucking make movie. it right, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was awesome. And it, 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 we wanted to make a movie that could also kind of that could grow its own legs and kind of spread word of mouth. So someone would see the movie and be like, "You have to see this fucking movie," and they would tell their friends, and then their friends would see it and be like, "This movie's kind of crazy. I think you should see it too." Because when I was a kid. Like, that's kind of how it was. You went to the video store, yeah. and you right. wanted to see the craziest movie they had. And then you asked the guy, the clerk, and you spoke to other people in the store, and they directed you to the craziest movie. And it was it was kind of like a competition every week who could pick the wildest, most fucked up movie, you know, for everyone to watch. And we kind of wanted to have an, we wanted to have an entry into that, into that idea. All right, all right. The story revolves around an innocent prank that goes terribly wrong yes girl gets pregnant Mm -hmm. then they want what's inside of her simple simple story yeah Yeah. you know simple emotional um when you deal with a story like that obviously there's going to be a good amount of body horror that goes along with it anytime that you've got a target of something inside of a woman something that really can be very challenging a very challenging perspective to not only film but understand it makes for very compelling as well as very might be very disgusting cinema inside's a great example by the time you're over what they've went through in that house 
handling body horror? What's going on with that? How much body horror can we expect with Get My Gun? Uh, it, it gets there's a pretty extreme scene that you probably won't think you're gonna see. It's gonna it, it's we we had the scene where you're watching the movie and you're like oh I hope this doesn't happen. No, that they're not gonna do that. And then we did it. Sure. You know, so we wanted we wanted to go all the way with it. Nice, nice. And, and that's one of the things when it comes to film festivals nowadays. Even the most high up film festivals, genre film festivals, you can afford to pull that off and find an audience with it. That's not something you could say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. This decade especially, you can say that. But Bardi Harjan with this, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so well, what we wanted to do was um, we wanted to make a movie where something terrible happened. And then you're sitting there and you're like, that's pretty fucking terrible. And then something else terrible happens and you're like, man, this poor girl, that's pretty fucking awful. (laughs) And then it just keeps getting worse and it keeps getting worse. And it's like, so that's like, we're calling it like a thriller where really horrible things happen to the point where at the very, very, very end, uh, I I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give that ending piece away because that's the part that's like, you know, it it slaps you in the face, right? And you're like, what the fuck is going on? (laughs) And then it happens. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. And it's one of those things where, like, a lot of stuff happens in the movie where it seems like the day-to-day life, you know? Like, just day-to-day-to-day-to-day. And you you think about these things, or or you don't think about these things, these sort of mundane, everyday things that happen in people's life, and they just kind of plot along, and you don't realize how all these tiny little things that you do can lead to far more intense situations, like... It's a really it's fucked up say. butterfly effect. It is effect. a really, really fucked is. up butterfly effect. <laughs> when you're dealing with a project like this indie film, you're not just a director. You're not just a co-writer. Oh you're not goodness. just a writer. <laughs> you know, how many? How much craft service did both of you handle wow. with this? Can yeah. you, first I'll throw over to you, Jen. Can you yeah. talk about taking on so many hats to make this happen here in Brooklyn, in New York City, and playing yeah. this weekend? Man, so what didn't, like, what <laughs> roles did we not take on ourselves? So, you know, as, as producer, you know, you want to... You know, my brother once said, you know, as a producer, you know, the thing that you're going to do is is you're going to manage a whole bunch of personalities and right. just manage a whole bunch of roles, right? So you go in thinking you're going to manage those things, but you're really taking everything on, right? <laughs> and so it's like you're pulling this cart that gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you're going along. So, you know, like with the producing, that was, you know, that was casting that was getting you know we didn't really have very many permits permits we did everything like super gorilla style on the street but um, we didn't have any permits I I should say that do I not want do I want to say that (laughs) so we didn't so that in and of itself became this like over like whelming situation that literally on a daily basis from the parks department to police to people in buildings to everyone like being able to get all of those people wrangled up and take care of them on the side so that he could take care of his business and the actors could do their job. And, you know, you also become, you know, the uh, catering situation right. and you become the cab service for everyone and you become mother and father on set and all those other ther- 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 yes, yeah. exactly, yeah. therapist on set, everything <laughs> on set, yeah. Uh, wardrobe, set design, like, I mean, you know, on a... On a film like ours, you know, you have to take on, you know, you don't necessarily always have the luxuries of being able to hire folks to uh, take on all those other pieces because, you know, you want to put all your resources into the stuff that's really, not that the other things aren't important, you want to put all your resources in one, you know, one of the things is sometimes you take on a lot of stuff and you're like, oh, I can do this and 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 you don't necessarily realize like wow <laughs> I'm doing it all <laughs> it makes you feel really war- rewarded when it you're here sitting on the weekend it with together. it it's amazing absolutely talk about the hats well it, it's weird when you're making a movie so you plan it and right. you rehearse and you make a shot list and you have every detail <laughs> completely planned out and you're like alright I can do 50 things if everything goes as planned exactly but nothing goes and as then. planned yeah and and, and the, the biggest part of filmmaking which a lot of people getting into it don't not that they don't understand but they don't know yet right is that once you start filming 50% of your day is problem solving because right. yeah. any shitty situation that could arise if there's something could go if either way it goes the bad way you know it's the ultimate example of 
Murphy's Law. You know, right. what can go wrong will go wrong, and it does go wrong. And you have to, you have to find a solution in that minute, or else, or else the day becomes a waste of time. You know, you have people there, you have other people counting on you. We're going to be here for three hours, and when we leave in three hours, this scene needs to be done, and that's it. So you, you might not be able to come back. Yeah, you may that's, never be able to come know. back. <laughs> we shot in one area on a public road where we kept getting chased away by an official, quote unquote, an official. <laughs> And it turned into a situation where it's like, we're going to keep coming back till we finish. So you could just give us an hour to finish or you could deal with us because we'll just keep coming. I'll come back three months from now. We'll just keep coming back till we finish the scene. Yeah. Finally, we just had to tell him like, dude, if you just let us finish, just give us another hour, an hour and a half and you'll never see us again. It's interesting. It was on the side of a road and he, he was like, cool, whatever. He stormed off. He was a little salty about it. it at that point he was like i don't want to see these people anymore so let me just give them the time they need. two weeks later we drove by the same location there was a guardrail installed guard on the rail. side of the road wow. so you can't pull over you can't get there anymore so we take a little pride and we, <laughs> we changed the landscape. yeah we changed the landscape we, like we caused a uh, a guardrail to go up <laughs> nice, nice. Hey, when you deal with that aspect of taking on so many hats it's not only you two but it's also the cast. It's also the crew that have something to do with oh, this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about what you were looking for with cast and crew for this production? Because you want, of course, you want people to take that leap because it's exploitation cinema especially. But you also want them to take that leap when you're not filming. Well, the big thing was finding people. You, you want someone who can act. You want someone who can do the technical job. But you also want somebody to get along with. So a sit-down interview kind of hanging out. Can I, would I hang out with this person? I want to spend all this time with this person, right? If it gets heated, are are we going to be able to work through it without holding any grudges, you know? So someone's personality goes a long way. It goes way further than their acting ability, way further than how good they can handle a camera. You need people that you can get along with, and that was important. You, You need team players. If you have someone who's just, I do sound, that's it. I'm not doing anything. If it doesn't involve sound, that's a problem. I can't work with you because we don't have the money to hire 20 more people to fill those shoes, you know? It's either insanity or dedication. We're not sure. Yeah. And and so with the actors, it's funny because um, the Amanda... um, And Kate Hoffman and Christy Casey, you know, it's funny because they came in the first day and auditioned together. And we had auditioned so many girls. And we were like, okay, we like this one, we like this one. But not necessarily felt, like, really, really good about, like, you know, but we had, like, lots of folks that we were like, yeah, all right, we can call them back. And then the second we saw that, and they auditioned together. And the second, like, there was, like, a moment where they were reading a part of the script together and they both like turned and did these actions together and they I don't know how to describe it but they they just kind of like moved in sync with each other and they had never met and they clicked and we clicked and Brian and I just looked at each other and we were like that's it that's them that's them when they came in the room together they seemed like they They like they knew each other already even though they only met five minutes prior in the hallway they just had the chemistry between them that they they seemed like they like they were friends already that really worked because then they hung out they rehearsed the scenes together on their own. We spent a and lot it, of time together. Yeah, it really it helped. And we put these we put these folks through the ringer. Yeah. So especially especially Kate sure. Hoffman, we really put her through the ringer. And so uh, I think Brian agrees as well as I that we could not have made a better choice. We really lucked out with her as a lead. It's interesting with an exploitation film, the makeup seems kind of different than a normal horror film because especially in this, you're dealing with body horror but you're also dealing with pregnancy you're dealing with abuse you're dealing with whatever the innocent prank was that will leave it at that it's a different kind of mentality for makeup uh beecher sniper i believe was on your your project she was one of the makeup team i've talked with her on the show before brilliant mind very creative mind what's the thinking going in from a practical makeup standpoint on an indie film with something that's not necessarily horror i didn't want to overdo it Okay. That was a big thing for me. I didn't want, but if you, the movie has a kind of a more serious tone than like a. There's no comedy in the movie at all. There may there's some funny parts, but right. it, it's it, the tone of the movie is extremely serious, and I felt that maybe if there was too much, it would have made it hokey, you know. So if 
say for example someone got stabbed and they lost you know 10 gallons of blood like the right. human body can't even hold 10 <laughs> gallons of blood you know it just it becomes too Overkill, much yes, you know so we we wanted someone who could kind of tone it down a little and be okay with it because a lot of spec, a special effects artists they want to go all out and and it's cool when it's right when the right. time's right but for this we felt that the effects should have been held back just they're, they're not totally and i want to make it sound like nothing's happening right. they're not just they're a little more on the <laughs> modest side of what someone else may have done that may have made it a little unbelievable or just turned it into something a little less serious because it deals with with a serious topic and there's some serious issues happening and i didn't want to disrespect those topics by going overboard somewhere else saying it. yeah i feel yeah. exactly the same way yeah it, it, it's it's wonderful to hear serious themes in an exploitation film because if you look back and i just talked with larry cohen not too long ago in austin you look at a lot of his work especially the black exploitation aspect there's some serious themes in there that play within that weave into the action and the over-the-top dramatics and stuff how important is it for a film like this now jen i'll throw it to you first from the writing side, how important is it to have things not only that people can connect to, but actually walk away with and might actually start a conversation with through this form of entertainment? So the uh, the film has a, a pretty brutal rape scene in it, um, and uh, you know we wanted to do and when we when Brian originally wrote the rape scene um, and we kind of talked it out and we we worked it out, you know we were from the very beginning he was very clear that he, he didn't want the, uh, how much do I want to give away? He doesn't want, he didn't, we didn't want the rape to be, um, you know, I feel like a lot of times in movies now, like rapes are almost like, uh, they try to make it like titillating or they try to show so much. And, you know, it's a horrible, terrible, I mean, it's the most disgusting thing that right. you can imagine. And it doesn't need to be seen to make it disgusting, right? It doesn't need to be in your face to make right. it disgusting. Um, and the way we filmed it, I think, like, when, when you watch the movie, you'll see that. And, and to a certain extent, like, you'll appreciate that. And, and you know, we did a lot of rehearsing of it. Um, and, and, you know, we wanted a lot of opinions from Kate. What was she comfortable with? And what was William, the, the, the guy who plays the rapist, what was he comfortable with? And, you know, you know, we conferred with all the women on the set, not just the actress. And how do you feel? And we had people look at it. Um, and so... You know, we have gotten a lot of questions about the rape scene and, and, and why did you put that in there? And, you know, and it, it's one of this it's one of the things where, you know, we wanted a movie where the situation was as bad as it could get for her. And then it gets worse and then it gets worse and then it gets worse. Exactly. And so it does. You know, it, it's it's definitely an exploitation film. Um, but it touches on like, you know, that how much more serious, especially with what's going on right now, how. Yeah. I mean, how much, you know, it really, really touches a nerve. I, and it, you know, we'll see tomorrow when people watch it, like how much of a nerve it touches, I guess. We'll find out. You ready to step on some nerves? Uh, I've been stepping on nerves. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I've been annoying people forever. But for me, when we were shooting the, the assault scene, I, I def, like what Jen said, I wanted to confer with the, with the actresses. Because I'm a guy, and what I see is, like my view of, of an assault is different you know it's just I can't I can never see it from a woman's point Absolutely. of view you know as, as hard as I try and as much as I say I can is you know everyone will try to bullshit and pretend that they can see it from women's I'm not a woman I cannot imagine I cannot imagine how how horrible it is you know so I needed I wanted to convey how horrible it is without being overly just without overdoing it, you know, so... Without the graphics? Yeah, yeah. you know, so I was... I guess... The actress has kind of conveyed to me that it's... The idea of what happened is of what's happening can probably be worse than actually seeing what's happening. And the hearing what's happening can actually be worse than seeing what's happening. Because now it allows your brain to fill in... Right. Allows so it to run. The person watching it can make it as graphic... Right or as tame as they as their mind allows so if, for someone if if that's a sensitive topic for them they can watch it and and take it from a tamer mental perspective and for someone who's not bothered by that for someone who's a little more intense they can 
have a more intense mental image. You know, it's really up to the viewer. And it's very like, subjective. Yeah. yeah, I feel like back in the day, like a more traditional grindhouse or exploitation film would have showed it and would have gone crazy with it, right? Because we've seen this from films in the past. You've seen it to um, degree, right? Yeah, yeah. Degree. it's insane. Yeah, it's insane, right? And so, and in many ways, what Brian just said, like sound is so much more horrifying sometimes than the right. visual than the visual. And so I think that comes through in the movie. We try to... We're letting the viewer take it where they where they want to go with it. It's interesting watching Veronica. There's a scene where she walks in with the gun into a shed that's pitch black. And all you see, all you hear is the firing and someone moving. And it's terrifying because you don't know what's there. And that's the, that's the thing about love, you know. Whether you're in the dark or... Or I should say sexually, when you're dark or not... When you have something in your mind and you're picturing the worst thing that person could possibly do, it goes into so many places, including that dark hallway that you're going down. We'll finish it with this. Thank you so much, you two. And I appreciate the time here with it. How important is sound and how important was the soundtrack of the city here? You can hear it right now for sure. But New York City has a sound set all of its own, the soundscape all of its own. And in exploitation... It has a sound set all of its own, over the top, a lot of, you know, different voices, different actions, guns, knives, weapons, whatever it might be over the, the lineage of exploitation. What does that soundscape sound like for Get My Gun? Well, what's interesting is when you film, you try to have everything as quiet as possible. Right. So you go to a busy location and you try to film with, without it being busy. Yeah. And then you go back and, and sound design, you add all the sounds in so you can control the, the, the environment. Um, for me, sound is really important. I think sound is almost more important than picture. You can watch a movie if the picture's so so and the sound is really good, or if you see a scene where it's a little dark, you can't see what's going on, but the sound is really good, you can right. still watch it. If you have a movie with the most beautiful image and the sound is shit, you're not going to watch it for more than really 10 hard. minutes. It's you're really not. hard, you're yeah. Gonna shut it off and walk away. Nice. So for me, sound is really important. Anything to add to that, I'm just thinking back with the with the post production and just all the time we spent um, in the studio. We, we had an amazing post production sound guy, and uh, we just spent. He was amazing. The Sound Lounge. Yeah. yeah, we mixed it at a place called Sound Lounge in New York City, and they they really worked with us because our budget was small. Right. And they were really cool, and they they just did a really good job. I mean, I cannot sing higher praises for that for that place. They they really handled it well and it, it far exceeded our expectations in sound design. Where is it playing after Brooklyn? After Brooklyn it goes down to the Orlando Film Festival on October 22nd. Then is that it, Shriek Fest? Uh no, it's just the Orlando Film So it's going to it's one of four oh, wow. genre type films playing there. Yep. Congratulations. So, E- oh, thank you. So either <laughs> there's some lucky few people that are getting to see genre movies, or there's going to be a bunch of shocked people that <laughs> had no idea what the fuck they were walking What's into. This about? Yeah. Oh, this looks fun. You like guns, you know, and it's going to be. Wow. It may give them nightmares. Fair enough. And then we go up to Cinepocalypse in Chicago. In Chicago, yeah. it's playing the Buffalo Dreams Fantastic Fest in nice. Buffalo. And a few other dates that I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But we're going to be talking to Sin Apocalypse, okay. and we're talking to uh, Buffalo Dreams in oh, the next nice. couple of weeks. So, so a we'll lot of there. film festivals. Yeah, so we'll really be talking with them forward. about the film. And uh, both of you, congratulations Thank on you very, very this much. weekend with the world premiere at the Brooklyn Horror Film Festival. Where can they find out more? Tragicbus.com. Tragic. But did you have a bad school experience? No, <laughs> we had. To- <laughs> so there's that song, Magic Bus, right? Okay. Are you going to try to I'm going to give you the story. So you, you can get this service called the Bark Box, where they mail you dog toys. And they mailed us a box of dog toys that had a hippie theme, and it had a Volkswagen Beetle in it. Not Beetle, Volkswagen Van in it. Van Bus, yeah, the Van. And she was joking around, and she was singing the Magic Bus song and driving and the... the dog was chasing the toy around. The chasing the thing around, and the dog chewed it up. And then, since it was all destroyed, I started my rendition of Tragic Bus, and that's where it came from. You know what? On that thought right there, because we, we have two puppies now, um, next time we get a bark box and we get a site, not a site, we got a Space Age squirrel and gopher, I'm going to call it Space Age squirrel and gopher just for you, Ryan. Just for you. <laughs> just for you, Ryan. Um, Real quick, you, you two being together, what does it mean to have each other on a future production? Wow. Uh, so, 
what can I say? I mean, it was a really, really grueling time. So it, it, you know, when you look back, it's fun, but at the time, you know, you're like, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, right? And it was just, uh, it was great to have somebody to, you know, go home with at the end of the night and kind of look back at all the things that had happened during the day and how are we gonna do things different tomorrow, you know? How can I support you and make that better, you know? Because as the director, like, as the producer, like, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I took on as much as I could so that he could just focus right. with his actors, right? And then he, you know, and so, you know, of course he didn't just focus with his actors, but, you know, I wanted to be that rock for him to lean on, and he was that rock for me to lean on, and it, it was nice to have that at the end of the day. It was really nice. Close it out. I think there's nothing better in the world than being able to create create stuff and put things into into the world you know so you make something before we started this movie didn't exist now it exists so i like i have a yearning to create things and put them into the world as corny as it sounds and is to me there's nothing better than being able to do that with loved ones you know and your life is just a culmination of memories you know so 40 years from now remember that fucking movie we made remember that stupid <laughs> shit we did remember that you know we can look back on it so i think it i, I, I think it was cool that we both happen to be into the same thing and we could create a memory that we could look back on in the future while creating something that other people can enjoy. So we put something into the world and we created a new memory for ourselves and I think that's really cool. Enjoyment is a fluid concept. We'll see that with Get My Gun. You two, thank you so much. Right, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Go and enjoy your we film will. from the Brooklyn Horror Film Festival, Horror Happens Radio.